Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bill Clifford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Councils of America in Washington, DC. And I'm very pleased to present to you a special program today in conjunction with the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center of Science and International Affairs and the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Belfer Center. This is called the American Diplomacy Project, a foreign service for the 21st century. And I'm bringing you a very distinguished panel of US ambassadors, Mark Grossman, Nancy McEldowney, and Marcy Reese, who will be speaking to you with me moderating for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And then for the latter half of the program, we invite you, our audience and our members and supporters at World Affairs Councils across the country to uh, ask questions of our panelists because this is a crucial issue for our country and our democracy and our presence and role in the world. Uh, before I introduce each panelist, a few housekeeping matters. This event is being streamed on YouTube Live and is being recorded. We want to invite as much interaction and participation among you as possible. We have more than 400 registrants today for this program. And the way you can do that is to use the YouTube Live chat box. Uh, your questions and comments there will end up with Liz Brailsford, my COO at WACA, and she will transfer them to me so that I can pose them to our panelists. I want to start this process right away. Um, you can be formulating your questions at any time during the, during the program, but I want to encourage you to, to think about the term foreign service and what thoughts and images that term comes to mind. Also, how the foreign service and its work abroad and at home affects your life, touches your life. If you could share that with us, this will be very meaningful to the work of our panelists and the group at the, at the American Diplomacy Project to, to present their recommendations later this fall to both political parties and ultimately uh, the next administration. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. Ambassador, Ambassador Mark Grossman is vice chairman of the Cohen Group, which is a global business consulting firm here in Washington, DC. Highlights of his career in the US diplomatic service include serving as US ambassador to Turkey, as US undersecretary of state for political affairs, which is the third ranking position at the State Department. and. He was called out of retirement by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and also left the chairmanship of WACA to become the US special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mark, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Ambassador Nancy McEldowney is a professor at the Georgetown University's Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Previously, previously she was director of the Foreign Service Institute, which prepares our diplomats and she has served as US ambassador to Bulgaria. Ambassador McEldowney also was interim director and senior vice president at the National Defense University here in Washington, DC. And Ambassador Marcy Reese spent nearly, well, 37 years uh, serving in our diplomatic service. Um, she is currently senior fellow at the Future of Diplomacy Project at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center, our partner for this event. And she's a specialist in national security and European affairs. She too has served as US ambassador to Bulgaria and also as ambassador to Albania. And she speaks about leadership and diplomacy to uh, new civilian and military leaders and mentors them. So uh, Ambassador Reese, Ambassador McEldowney, Ambassador Grossman, thanks so much for being here. Let's get into it. You're talking about an important thing, how to reform and strengthen the US Foreign Service for the 21st century, how to modernize it. But first, I wanna start with you, Mark, as our former chairman of WACA. What do you see as really what you say is a crisis of American diplomacy and in the Foreign Service? Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for taking time this afternoon to spend some time with us to discuss this very important uh, project. And I'm delighted to be joined by my co-chairs in this project, Nancy McEldowney and, and Marcy Reese. Um, first of all, two thank yous are, 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 are in order here. First of all, Bill, thank you very much for the invitation. And if we could just thank Rachel and Liz who helped organize this conversation, we're greatly, greatly appreciated, appreciated of that. Um, as you said, I had the good fortune to 
uh, serve as the chair of the National World Affairs Councils of America. So I'm a believer uh, in this organization. I believe in the network. And one of the things that we knew from the very beginning of this project was that it was going to require citizen input. If exactly as you say, we were able to find a way to more, more accurately connect uh, the Foreign Service and US citizen interest. And it would require and it would benefit from that interest. And we called on the network. And the network so far has responded fantastically. So our very first use of the network was way back on the 7th of May, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. And we thank Jim Falk and his collaborators for a fantastic uh, session that we had. At that time, we really just had some vague ideas about what we wanted to say, but we got this input. About the same time, Ambassador Reese did a program uh, at Nashville World Affairs Council and again, took in some enormously important uh, input. Uh, we have the opportunity to be here today uh, and Peoria, uh, we're gonna do the Peoria World Affairs Council on September the 21st. And so what's that mean? It means, Bill, exactly the question that you posed. What's important here about citizen interest when it comes to rethinking the challenges of the Foreign Service? And I think one of the overriding themes that we've found in all of the conversations we've had inside Washington, outside Washington, people who've been in the Foreign Service, been in the Foreign Service, is that after this pandemic, that societies are gonna to need to find practical and concrete ways to better realign the interests of American citizens with the way that leaders define the national interest. And I think that's been something that we've heard again and again and again. And that's especially true of the Foreign Service. So when you ask me, sort of what's the crisis? I say the crisis is, if you look at that first paragraph of the piece of paper that we sent to everybody, what's it say? It said the service is today losing its capacity to serve the American people. And our goal is to try to rebuild that capacity and reconnect with the citizens of the United States. The other very important thing I'd like to say about that first paragraph is yes, there's a crisis. And we're gonna hear a lot of things today about what should be better. But I wanna make sure that every single person on this call recognizes that we honor the people who are serving today. We honor them. And so this is not about criticism of them. This report is for them so that their future can become even brighter and they can do more for citizens of the United States. So our view is this challenge is a real one. It didn't start four years ago. The idea that it'll all just go back to the way it was and that'll be fine isn't possible because it wasn't fine then. We've come to also believe that the Foreign Service needs to do some very important self-examination. Who is the Foreign Service? What are we? How do we serve the American people? Because this again is not a question of someone imposed all these terrible things on the service. A lot of it is about the Foreign Service culture itself. There's a long-term decline. That's the crisis that needs to be halted with good ideas and actions. And so we hope that with your help, a national dialogue, which the network is playing such an important and key role here, will be the start of something big. Uh, and that whoever is inaugurated president on January 20, 2021, uh, will be able to use some of the recommendations that we've made and reconnect the service to the citizens' interests of the United States of America. Thank you for those opening remarks, Mark, and for referring to the document, the two-page document that we shared with our uh, members and, and the public, uh, which included five recommendations. And I'm going to um, discuss, ask uh, Nancy and Marcy to discuss two each and come back to you for the fifth. Um, Nancy, before we get into um, uh, recommendations one and two, which uh, have to do with a new mandate and mission for foreign service officers and diplomats. Um, I'd love, because Mark said, who, who are the Foreign Service? What do we do and who, how do we serve? Could you talk about your own career path in the context of uh, the recommendations too? I'd be happy to. Thanks very much, Bill. And I'm so pleased to have a chance to reach out to all of your members and the listeners on this call. Um, I love that question because I love encouraging people to think about the Foreign Service as a career path and to think about national service as part of their lives. Um, and I also wanna to stress to people that it's not out of reach. 
people look at me and they say, oh, you've been an ambassador. You must have had some extraordinary background that made this career possible for you. And that's just not true. I come from a family of very modest means. Um, my my uh, father, all the men in my family were in the military. When my dad got out of the Marine Corps, he opened a small restaurant. My husband's entire family are dairy farmers from Wisconsin. And so these are many of the people in my family had never left the United States. And when I found my interest in looking at the larger world, um, I talked to different family members about it. None of them had ever heard of the Foreign Service. They didn't know what it meant, what we did, but they encouraged me because of the values that that all of Americans, I believe, still hold dear, which is patriotism and public service and trying to do the right thing for other people in this country and around the world. And so I went to school with the help of Pell Grants and scholarships. And when I got there, counselors talked to me about a possible career in the Foreign Service. And it has been a tremendous adventure. So, uh, you know, the, the fun quotient is very high for anybody who's out there thinking about it as a possibility. But even more importantly, it's so deeply gratifying because people will see that they can contribute. With my background and having lived through three decades of public service, which also gave me the chance not just to live and work around the world, but to serve at the White House, to serve in the Pentagon. Um, it has made me realize something that Mark said that was so important, which is diplomacy, national security, foreign policy. These shouldn't be abstract or foreign concepts. These are things that every American citizen in every city and town across this country should be able to say, yeah, I get it. These people work for me, and here's how their work advances my interests. So our recommendations are, first of all, that we write a new mission statement for the Foreign Service that makes that clear, that talks about American aspirations, our values, the diversity and multiplicity of our country and how the Foreign Service <laughs> needs to represent that and advance it. We also want to make sure that the Foreign Service has a new mandate because Washington's kind of a confused and complicated mm -hmm. place. There are a lot of different agencies, a lot of different efforts underway. We think the Foreign Service should coordinate foreign policies to make sure that it is most effective, cohesive, serves the purpose that it's set out for, and to make sure that we get all that done along with a number of the things that, that my colleague Marcy will talk about we believe that it's time for new legislation. It's been over 40 years since the Foreign Service has had authorizing legislation. Think about the, how the world has changed in those 40 years. New challenges, new countries, all sorts of things that have dramatically changed and we're calling for transformational change in the Foreign Service We'd like a new legislation that would be akin to what Goldwater Nichols did for the US military. We'd like to see that kind of transformational change with high standards, high effectiveness for the Foreign Service so that we get back to where we started, that we're doing the best we possibly can for the American people. Thank you, Nancy. As a quick follow-up before I go to Marcy, you mentioned the Foreign Service Act and the authorization of the Foreign Service. It was founded and um, authorized first in 1924 with the Rogers Act. How many iterations of it have there been? And, and why, why has it been 40 years That's with, so much, with so much change in the yes. world and in technology and so forth? Well, in the last hundred years, there have only been three pieces of legislation, three Foreign Service Acts. You mentioned one of them, the Rogers Act. There was another in 1946. Obviously, the world had changed dramatically after the World War. Um, and then in 1980. But for a variety of reasons, and, and we think 
some of them were timidity and confusion. Now it is time, it is long past time for legislation that will not just authorize the Foreign Service, but catalyze what we are calling for is real transformational change. We don't wanna just reform around the edges. We're living in a new world, post COVID, recession, climate change, dramatic issues. We wanna reinvent and reimagine a better, stronger diplomacy for our country and for the world. Marcy, so much of what Nancy just mentioned, those issues and how, how policy and execution happens, comes down to people, to personnel. And your recommendations, your uh, two of the five recommendations center on just that question. Um, I would like you to begin, however, by talking about your experience too, as a woman in the Foreign Service uh, and what it has meant to have secretaries of state like Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice and, and Hillary Clinton um, for um, your for leaders who, who you may have served and, and for also um, the current uh, diplomats in the service? Well, thank you for that question and for the opportunity to participate in this in this conversation. My, my first time that I set foot in the State Department was actually as an intern. And while I, while I was still in college and while I was there, the then Undersecretary for Management gave a groundbreaking speech in which he said that women would no longer have to quit the Foreign Service if they got married. <laughs> and uh, this, um, uh, this really kind of stuck with me. And in fact, it became an important factor in my life because my husband and I joined the Foreign Service more or less together. We became what was called a tandem couple. But our experiences were definitely not the same. So for example, at my first post, my husband, who was an economic officer, was thrown quickly into his work. And in my first conversation with my boss, he told me, well, I don't think it's appropriate for you to have male contacts as a political officer. And we, we overcame this over time. But I think your other point about seeing female secretaries of state and, three, and female role models is, is very important. My first encounter with, uh, with a woman in a position of importance was when Roz Ridgway became the assistant secretary for Europe. And that, that happened at the same time that I was at this post. And it really made a very big difference for me. And I think for the other women in the foreign service be able to see that someone is in a position of authority and is while being female. And so things have changed uh, quite, I would say quite a lot during the time that I've been in the foreign service. And to turn back to uh, some of the recommendations that we're making, we've talked, uh, Nancy and Mark have talked quite a bit about the importance of our connection to people and, our, and to the American people in particular. Now, another subject, a related subject that we've talked about a lot is the importance of reinforcing the nonpartisan nature of the Foreign Service, that we represent all of the American people. In the 37 years, as you mentioned, that I was a Foreign Service officer, I served under six presidents I was appointed ambassador by George W. Bush and then by Barack Obama. And this, we see this as a normal, uh, normal career pattern for a foreign service officer. But something else that's happened in the course of my career is that the number of political appointees in the State Department has increased significantly, both uh, abroad as ambassadors and in Washington, to the point that today we don't have any career officers as assistant secretaries. And those are sort of the line officers in the Foreign Service. And uh, so this makes, um, this, this is something we think really should be attended to. And, and one way of doing this would be to legislate 
a number uh, or a percentage of uh, ambassadors who should be career officers. And we think that the right number is 90% of them. So that's, that is a recommendation that we've been making. So on, uh, on the on other questions of personnel, we first thought that we didn't wanna get into sort of the details of, of how the personnel system is managed. But in listening to people, th these issues came up so often that we decided that we really needed to look at that. So, uh, so uh, the, one of the first things that we thought about was that we really needed a total overhaul of the personal system, that we needed, it needed just really to be reinvented. Why? Because one of the reasons why is because every group that we talked to brought up the question of diversity and the fact that the, that the State Department, although certainly we have had diversity as an objective, as a desired uh, state, has really not succeeded in, in achieving the goals that it set. I have um, a colleague who has, uh, was in service 30 some years and he told me that, for example, the percentage of uh, Latin ex uh, officers had really not changed in, in the 30 years since he was in service. And right now we only have four African-American ambassadors and only one of them is a woman. So this has to be a top level priority is, um, is writing this situation. And that's gonna take a lot of attention to diversity, but also to inclusion and to, um, and to holding managers responsible at every level for inclusion uh, in the foreign service. No doubt, I would think at a time when we're seeing this social upheaval in our country and our values, which are so important to the uh, explanation and role of US power in the world, um, you know, are simply uh, diminished if we don't have people from communities of color um, uh, articulating those values at, at posts overseas, wouldn't you say? Yes, of course. I, there have been so many studies that have shown that um, diverse workforces work better. And, and I think the other point that's really important is back to the earlier point about representing the American people. The American Foreign Service should look like the American people. I, well, I feel very strongly about that. Thank you. Um, I, I want to encourage our audience to continue to send questions, which I'm now seeing in my chat box. Uh, those of you who are watching from YouTube live can do so, and we encourage as many from around the country as we can uh, receive. Uh, Mark, back to you for the fifth and final recommendation, which is one of, of nomenclature. Um, and, and I've wondered this myself because, um, you know, to make the Foreign Service less foreign to Americans is a part and parcel of uh, creating um, currency for the service that should be um, equally honored to what our military service, our intelligence service, and all civil service uh, uh, offers to our country. Bill, thank you very much. And that's exactly the conclusion we came to. I must say, uh, when we started this process, um, it started really as a, a little bit light, as a little bit humorous. People would say things like, oh yes, in my 30 years in the foreign service, most people in the United States thought I was in the Foreign Legion. Oh yes, when I was in the Foreign Service and I went to rent a car, people would say, oh, you must be in the Forest Service. Or you'd say, no, no, I'm in the Department of State. And if you were in Iowa or California or New Mexico, people would say, well, really the State Department of what? And we got to realize that this had happened so often and to so many of the people in the Foreign Service that we started to think a little bit about the idea of changing the name. It then got quite serious for all the reasons that you have raised, uh, which is to say that we wanted to do something new. We wanted to send a message that it wasn't going to be just the way it was, that there was gonna be something different. And I must say that there were people who said, oh, don't bother with this, it's just a name. But we came to conclude that a name means something and that the, the way people get up and go to work in the morning, whether it's in Washington or overseas, 
They want to be part of something that's happening. And the way to, to show them that was to change the name. And so as you said, uh, we've recommended that this be called the United States Diplomatic Service. And it's not foreign, it's diplomatic. And it's about service. And that we think is, an, is a very important thing. Um, we've had, as you, as I told you, about 18 or 20 um, various workshops. And in most of them, we said, okay, here's a straw poll. Who's in favor of this? And I must say, overwhelmingly, particularly people who are serving officers said, yes, we'd like to have that change. And I hope that the outcome would be more connection to American citizens. And as you say, respect, if we earn it, uh, as our military earns it and that we can call ourselves a diplomatic service and not a foreign service. And Mark, just to um, follow up with you on that, uh, how, how did members of Congress react? Um... That's a great question. And very positively, uh, a number of them said, there's a good idea. I'd be in favor of that. And I, I can't speak for all of them, uh, but the, those who spoke on the subject uh, spoke on it quite positively. Um, Nancy, I, something Mark said in his very uh, in his opening remarks had to do with capacity, and um, some people remarked that the U.S. diplomatic corps, our foreign service, is the front line of defense. General Mattis said that he needed more foreign service officers, or else he'd need to spend more money on military personnel and, and hardware. Um, the foreign service budget is about 1% of the overall federal budget and um, the cost of military interventions literally blows that away. How can more funding come to back up the changes that you're seeking? It's a terrific question. And thus far, our report has addressed some very specific programs that we are calling for funding for. Uh, we haven't gotten into the overall budget, but as your question suggests, it's a key, key issue. You get what you pay for. And if you shortchange the instrument that is the forward deployed shield for our country, we are the early activation, early warning service we are the people who are on the ground, speaking the languages, understanding foreign societies, relaying that back to Washington. And if we are not funded and staffed, if we are hollowed out so that we don't have full diplomatic readiness, can't perform our jobs, uh, then we're not going to be as effective as we should be. There are gonna be some hard trade-offs a new Congress is gonna to have to take on how much money is gonna to go to different programs. And I, I don't wanna rob Peter to pay Paul, but I will say that I think there has been both a militarization of the content of our foreign policy over many years, as we've been persecuting multiple wars, but there's also been an over, an imbalance with too much money, too many resources, too much priority being placed on the military instrument, which should be the instrument of last resort and not enough on diplomacy, which is the instrument of first and continuous resort. Very good. Again, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come to you, Marcy, in a minute, but I want, because Nancy, you're at the Georgetown mm -hmm. uh, School of Foreign Service, I have another question for you. Please. Um, and this concerns, uh, one of our best diplomats, uh, Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch. Mm -hmm. um, she was targeted by associates of the president. Uh, she was surveyed. She was driven from her post as ambassador to Ukraine. She ended up courageously testifying before Congress in the impeachment hearings. The Secretary of State did not defend her once. I'm wondering what all of that said, what set of messages does that send to foreign service officers and diplomats. Um, also, I had the privilege of attending a wonderful event where she was presented with the J. Uh, Raymond Trainer Award at, at Georgetown in February, one of the last events publicly that I, I could go to and she made a terrific speech. Mm -hmm. And Bill Burns, uh, now of the Carnegie Endowment, moderated her and spoke of the rot in our State Department. 
-hmm. What is the message of that kind of politicization? Yes, yes. Um, the, what happened, not just to Masha Yovanovitch, but to all of the diplomats who were involved, all of the, the people who were serving, not just at Embassy Ukraine, but throughout the Foreign Service when they saw that what is designed as, defined as a nonpartisan service that was brought into partisan manipulations or a domestic political errand, um, it was really demoralizing. And um, Ambassador Yovanovitch, who is, as you know, and you saw when you saw her, an incredible professional, she stood tall and handled the crisis. But I know that there were many other younger people, including many of my students, who were asking hard questions about what this meant for their future, what it meant for the future of the Foreign Service. We have called, as Marcy very clearly laid out, for a strengthening of the nonpartisan nature of the Foreign Service by limiting political appointments, rebuilding the internal culture, which is so important inside the State Department, um, so that we are able to, to bolster the integral core there. But we have to face up to the fact that it was really tough. And you and many of the listeners here will know that applications into the Foreign Service have dropped by 50%. That's the lowest number that it's been in a decade. Mm -hmm. And what we, need, what we are trying to do through these recommendations is to say, this is a great instrument for our country, a great career path for people. But as Mark said, the Foreign Service needs to earn it. Stand up, take on more responsibility, build that internal integrity. Thank you for that. Marcy, in terms of you know, personnel as part of capacity, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the American uh, Foreign Service Association um, has figures that there are some close to 16,000 uh, uh, Foreign Service personnel in the world at um, 270 or so posts. We lost one in China recently in retaliation for our uh, disbanding the, the Houston consulate. But China now has more uh, posts and uh, diplomats around the world than we do. How important is it that we um, ramp up our numbers? And in, the, in light of what uh, Nancy just said about uh, declining applications to join and, and how far recruitment is down, is there any hope to get that rebound? Well, we certainly hope so, <laughs> I would say. But um, I think that uh, our, our posts around the world, we have always had a principle of wanting to be uh, represented worldwide. At the end of the Soviet Union, when, uh, when the wall came down and uh, the new countries became independent, we really made it a priority to get out there and open our, our representations very quickly. And I think that is a, a quite important part. People, the, the United States of America is a beacon for the world. We, uh, we want people to see us and to see our people. And of course, one of our key responsibilities is protecting American citizens abroad. And that's another reason to be present. Uh, we need to be places where there are a lot of American citizens who may need our help. So that, that would be another reason for, for looking at that. Great. Mark, I wanna present a question from Charles Shapiro, Ambassador Charles Shapiro, who heads our World Affairs Council of Atlanta and very finely so. Um, he's asking, isn't it time to eliminate the distinction between foreign service and civil service at state and between officers and specialists in the field? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think that's a, that's a very important question. One of the things that we have considered uh, is, is that the State Department will never succeed um, unless the Foreign Service, or we hope the Diplomatic Service, uh, is successful. And without a successful civil service, uh, the department won't succeed either. And I would say also, you have to pay attention to all the wonderful people who work for us overseas who are engaged locally, right? People who, who are Pakistanis who work in Pakistan or Indians who work in India and other places. 
So these pillars uh, of the State Department all have to be successful. And one of the things that we have supported kind of in other reports, not so much in ours, um, is that the civil service needs, at least at the State Department, and I will just use the word, civil service needs to be liberated uh, from some of the challenges it has in its personnel system. And there are ways to do this, and they're not hard, I don't think, they're not expensive, uh, but there needs to be a liberation of the, of the civil service so they can continue to play the really important role that they, that they have. I would say to the question of, would I retain a distinction between foreign service today, the diplomatic service in the future and civil service? Yes, I would, because people choose different paths. The foreign service and the diplomatic service are for people who mostly want to serve abroad. And one of the things that's very important is to get foreign service officers into our embassies abroad. And we, want to, and we, we will speak to, in our report, the need to do more of that. Some people choose the civil service for various other reasons. They'd rather stay put. They'd rather be at home. They'd rather study one or two things. That's fine. It's the combination of the foreign service and the civil service seems to me so important. On the second question of the distinction between generalists and specialists. So here, what we've said is the first thing that has to go uh, are these distinctions inside of the service that we call cones. Uh, every, you're a political officer, you're an economic officer, you're a public diplomacy officer, as if these jobs are different than one another. And if you do consular work, oh, you can't possibly do public diplomacy work. Well, on the contrary. And so we want to get rid of the cone system first and foremost. Second thing is there may be a case, and I think there is, for more specialization. Think about the digital age, you know, the data scientists, people who really understand the data. Think about science generally. And so it may be, Charlie, that there's a room for, there's room for specialists uh, to come, especially in this, new, in this new world, where you wouldn't want 30 years of a foreign service career. You'd want them to do this job. Uh, and our report calls for much more flexibility in that regard. So it may not be for amalgamating completely, but it's for finding more flexibility to get the right people to do the right job. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, Marcy, a question from a Wrangell Fellow and HKS student who asks, what have been some of the barriers to the recommendations you've been presenting, such as the reauthorization of the USFS Act, the new mandate and mission and so forth? Thank you for your time and your service, Mohib. Oh. Well, thank you for the, for the question. Well, um, I, I don't know about barriers, but I think what we are proposing is something quite ambitious. It's something that is, uh, in the words of one of the people who participated in our, in our workshops, big and bold. And it's true that, that a, a significant piece of legislation for the Foreign Service hasn't been written in 40 years. So we're talking about an ambitious undertaking that will need the support of Congress, of the White House, and of the American people. So that's a that's a pretty big that's a pretty big undertaking. So I think that's the way that we need, but that's the way we need to think about it. Because as we've said, the Foreign Service belongs to the American people, and it and it and it will it will take all that to make the kind of transformation that we are talking about. Excellent. Um, Nancy, this question is from Matt Butler, who is a member of WACA's Chairman Circle, also known as the 1918 Society, the year of our founding. Um, Matt writes, I didn't know much about the Foreign Service until I was attached to the Department of State in Baghdad as a junior military officer in 2005. How is the Foreign Service creating inroads with high school students, especially in areas with traditionally less representation, to educate them regarding di diplomatic career paths. Is there anything that the Georgetown School of Foreign Service or its graduate students or undergraduate students do with um, high schoolers? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. And it's also fascinating that one of your members learned about the Foreign Service through military service uh, and being associated in Baghdad. So thanks for that. Um, Currently, the Department of State does not do a great deal of work in high schools mm -hmm. And that's one of the areas that we have targeted and said, 
we need to reach out to young people at a much earlier age to get them interested in public service, writ large, interested in the State Department and the Foreign Service. One of the proposals that we have been looking at very closely is establishing a large scale ROTC-like program where students who are interested in the Foreign Service could get some sort of financial assistance to get them through college along with sustained training and engagement from people who will talk to them about the kind of skills and leadership attributes that are necessary to succeed in the Foreign Service. Uh, because as one of your earlier questions alluded to, I think the Foreign Service, we need a surge. We need to be bigger, we need to be better funded, and we need much greater professionalization. So we're looking at ROTC to get more young people in. We've also looked very hard at the idea of a diplomatic reserve corps so that citizens who have specialized skills in times of international crisis or national emergency could be activated and, and the country could benefit from, from their knowledge and their expertise. These are the kinds of big and bold programs along with breaking down bureaucratic barriers and changing the internal culture. Something very hard to do, but really important if we're gonna turn this organization around. Mark, I'm gonna to come to you in a minute, but because of what Nancy just said, I wanna stay with that kind of topic about personnel and, 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 and move to Marcy. Um, Marcy at Harvard, the philosopher, Michael Sandel has a new book called The uh, Tyranny of Merit. And basically, I mean, when you think of government bureaucrats um, in general, um, there hasn't been all the time a great reputation. And when you think of elite bureaucrats and people who are white and hyper-educated and have pursued uh, uh, careers in diplomacy in the past, that reputation still lingers. Um, uh, you've said so yourself today. So. What can, what can we do to recruit differently? How can we get people who are not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, skill sets that are different into um, the service? Well, uh, one of the possibilities is one you mentioned, which is reaching down into high schools and beginning to interest people at a young age at, to coming into the foreign service. We do have, uh, in many universities in the United States, representatives, diplomatic diplomats in residence. And one of their responsibilities is recruitment and they are spread out across the United States. I think we need to do more of that. And I think we can, we here we can take a page from our military colleagues who, who ask that their own members go out and recruit. And one of the things that we're thinking about in, the, in terms of cultural change is service to the organization. And that would be one way, a really interesting way to provide service to the organization, to have, uh, have foreign service officers go out and be recruiters uh, as part of their uh, building up their own organization. So I think, I, I think that that is another way, but we really need to do more things like this, where we get out and talk to the American people about what we do and, um, how it might be interesting to them as a profession. Mark, um, this comes from Herman Cohen, who I believe is Hank Cohen, the US Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs in the early 90s. He says, looking at all, and I'm asking you because of your experience in uh, Afghanistan, um, looking at all those new super secure US embassies around the world, I have the impression that the US Foreign Service is cut off from those foreign publics we need to be talking to. Is this a fair observation? Hank, I think it is. And one of the things in our report will be to try to rebalance this question of risk management. And uh, I understand, I, I, like you, Ambassador Cohen, I have been responsible for human beings abroad. And I know that their security is a very, very important thing, perhaps often the most important thing. But you're right to say that there needs to be a different set of thoughts about risk management and risk avoidance. Um, and I think that uh, we, have, we will recommend that there's increasing effort to show risk management for precisely the reasons that you say. 
uh, which is that we want to have our diplomatic service farther out in societies, knowing more people, to being out. And that, that sometimes comes with its risk. And we've seen that risk for many, many years. But I think, and again, your audience will tell me, but I think the public in the United States of America is prepared to recognize that if, you, if you're that kind of active diplomatic service, that it comes with some risk and that it will never be of zero risk, just like service in the military will never be of zero risk. And I think the American public is ready to say, okay, in order to have a diplomatic service that represents me, is on the front line, is far out in these societies, understands what's going on, we recognize there's going to be some risk. And so there needs to be a better way to manage this question of risk aversion uh, and risk management. And one of the things that we will focus on uh, is to try to put in some recommendations that do just that. I would say uh, uh, Ambassador Cohen, Hank Cohen is a member of a group called the American Academy of Diplomacy. And at the moment, there's a very good study going on about how to change the accountability review boards, right? So that people don't just pay the price for every terrible thing that happens uh, without some understanding of what they were trying to accomplish. And I hope that that will find some resonance uh, with the administration and with people on the Hill. So I appreciate the question. Great. Um, not that we want to create a food fight here, but I'm going to start combining questions and you can jump in if you feel that this is something where your expertise or insight is particularly germane. Um, these are from council leaders around the network. Uh, first, from Derek Olson, president of World Oregon. As a former foreign service officer, I would like to know your recommendations about how state and the diplomatic service can reassert leadership among foreign affairs agencies so that state isn't just seen pejoratively by some as the landlord in our embassies overseas. And I wanna ask a second question, what role relationship, uh, this is from Christine Sheckler, who is a USAID FSO and a former Peace Corps uh, uh, volunteer who heads the San Diego World Affairs Council. Christine asks, what role relationship do you envision for USAID and its foreign service offices? And maybe you can also explain the many little sub organizations that we may not know are actually part of the foreign service, commercial, agricultural, and so on. Who wants to take either of those questions? Um, I'm happy to start, especially uh, with the first one that uh, was posed from Oregon, because I think it's a really important point that, uh, he makes, and it goes directly to the point that we have made about a new presidential mandate for the State Department and for the Foreign Service. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, and as your, the questioner from Oregon has mentioned, um, sometimes the State Department is looked at as the landlord in embassies overseas, and there's a lot of interagency infighting, a lot of inefficiency in terms of how policy gets made in Washington. Just as every American ambassador overseas gets a letter from the president which says, you are my senior, my personal representative. You are uh, the top US government official in country, we believe that that what we call chief of mission authority is extremely important to ensure the effectiveness of US government operations overseas. And we think that a similar approach should be taken for senior officials who are coordinating uh, the development of policy from the State Department. So chief of mission authority mandate for the State Department, which says you've got the, the uh, responsibility to coordinate and to deliver a clear response. Uh, in answer to Christine about AID, our report focuses on the Foreign Service within the State Department, but we feel so strongly about the importance of development of the work that AID does, as well as there are other foreign services. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has a foreign service, uh, the Department of Commerce has the Foreign Commercial Service. So there are a number of different foreign services and we need to think hard about how these foreign services are working together to serve the American people and American interests. 
If I could just, uh, if you'd allow me, I just uh, want to follow up on the point that Nancy made. Um, and that is that letter is extremely important, as she said, overseas. Um, and one of the things we'd like to see is a similar letter uh, then given to somebody at the State Department, an assistant secretary, for example, in Washington, D.C., so that they also have this responsibility. And the second thing is a theme that has come from the three of us is that the State Department and the Foreign Service is going to have to earn their way back to this kind of primacy. In other words, I don't think that one morning someone will wave a wand and say, oh, I'd like to do this differently. And, you know, people should all, everybody should listen to the State Department Foreign Service. I think this will take some time and it'll take some legislation, but it'll also take, as Nancy and Marcy have said, more professionalization, better utilization of the people, and a new and, th and, and a new way of thinking about the culture so that people can earn this responsibility and then people will follow. Great. Marcy, it's your turn. Um, I have two questions related to personnel matters. The first is from Stephen Haig from the Netherlands. As a non-American, and he's not Dutch, he's Canadian, I happen to be a good friend of Steve from years ago, teaching English in Japan. Thanks for being on, Steve. He asks, I've always been mystified by the number and depth of, depth of political appointments in the US Foreign Service relative to almost everyone else ever. He was, by the way, in the Canadian court, diplomatic court. It's great to hear the advocacy for change, but why so late? And from Susan Page, I'll pair these. Should Trump have fired all ambassadors upon taking office as Obama did? An ambassador does not set foreign policy. The president does. Should ambassadors work actively against a president? Marcy, you get the firing line. Okay. Well, um, first of all, for, um, for Stephen, it is true that we have always had uh, in our service a mix of um, political appointees and career ambassadors. Over time, it was generally a sort of 70-30 ratio, but that, is, uh, that has changed in, in the last few years. Um, this, is, uh, this goes all the way back to our early history when we didn't have career uh, diplomats at all. And uh, as you mentioned, we we're kind of late coming into the game that uh, the career service wasn't established until 1924. But um, I think for the reason that I, that I mentioned earlier, and that is the nonpartisan nature of our service, that if, um, if we start having political appointees so deep down into the service, at, especially for the, um, the frontline off offices, the assistant secretaries, uh, then that begins to um, that begins to change that image of a totally nonpartisan service. Um, on the question of um, all ambassadors resigning at the beginning of a, an administration, that is our practice, and uh, normally presidents uh, decide whom they will retain and whom they will replace. And that, uh, that's pretty much, um, I would say, a convention that, uh, that happens with all changes of administration. Okay, I am looking for a question because the avalanche of questions means I cannot find the many from Alan Anderson. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go to Mike Pappas for now, and I'll, I'll collect Alan's question in a moment. This is an incredible uh, response, um, by the way. It seems to me like partisan forces have tried to paint career diplomats as politically motivated. Is there a way to fight this rhetoric while remaining nonpartisan? Seems to be a double-edged sword. Marcy, you got into that. Um, uh, part of your discussion is going to be with members of Congress who are notoriously politicized. How, how are you gonna resolve that? Well, I would say um, we, we've had this conversation now a little bit with uh, members of Congress and yes, they said, we're political animals, right? We're gonna do this. And of course, part of our response is, but you don't do this to the uniform military. You know, nobody says that 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% of generals and admirals should be political appointees. And so it seems to us there has to be some balance here. And 
Uh, that's the important question is that foreign service, or I hope the diplomatic service someday, should be treated by and large like our military officers. And people don't say we're going to make the captain of the USS America a political appointee. It doesn't work that way. And I and we're not for zero political appointees. Let me be clear about that, right? There are wonderful, wonderful people who have something to contribute to the representation of the United States of America. And, and we ought to be open to that because they bring new ideas and they bring new ways of doing things. So I'm not for zero, but I'm not for 40%. And I just asked the audience to consider the question of, would you do this to our uniform military? Would you have the, the, the head of the, the, you know, the, the base commanders and captains of ships be 30% political appointees? I don't think you would. This is uh, related and it is from Alan Anderson. Alan, A-L-L-Y-N. Um, how does the State Department plan to work on America's tendency towards saviorism and occupation? The U.S. has become an enemy or at best neutral to the people of many countries. Are we going to improve that? I, I'd say you have to improve that. Well, I mean, one of the reasons to have a more professional uh, foreign service uh, is so that A, uh, you don't find yourself wandering into places where you shouldn't be. And two, as Nancy said and Marcy said, you don't use your military force as, the, as, 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 a, as, a, as a utility of first resort. Uh, and so my view would be uh, the, more, uh, the more foreign service officers that you have, the better trained they are, the more professional that, you are, that they are, the farther out in societies that they are, as we talked about before, that you increase your likelihood uh, of not blundering into these kinds of mistakes. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's the reason that we, that we think about uh, the connection between a, an enhanced diplomatic service and citizen interest in this regard. Can I just add a quick word to that? Because I agree completely with everything that Mark said. I think there's another point to it. The, the questioner notes the extent to which the U.S. reputation, our standing around the world, has gone from being 90% positive to less than 10% positive. In many countries, the United States is now viewed in a very, very negative light. There are many reasons for that. We can discuss all of them, but one of the things that I would say is we need a new approach to diplomacy that is not going to rest on the principles that have guided us over the course of the last several decades. It's been easy for people to just fall back on American dominance being the sole superpower having the adoration and the alliance of many countries around the world. Our diplomacy is gonna to have to be smarter, faster, more modern. We're gonna to have to master new issues. Um, and all of that is gonna take very hard work in terms of professionalization, new issues, but new approaches. And, and I love the term that Mark used, we need to liberate the, the bureaucratic structures and, and many of, of our own mindsets about how we think about these issues. Related to, related to that one question from um, former diplomats who, who have run a very great council in Traverse City, the International Affairs Forum. This is Jack and Karen Siegel. And they, and they ask, isn't a revamp of how we collect, analyze, and communicate our wisdom overdue? Uh, it seems a little quaint that we're still sending cables to the department. A lot of laughter. Yeah. Can, can I, uh, first I got to say, Karen and Jack are dear friends, so I'm, I'm thrilled that they are on this call, and I, I wish them all the best. Um, and I love the question they've asked. Because one of the things that the State Department needs is an approach to knowledge management that is built on a very sophisticated technological framework, but that approaches it from a conceptual diplomatic frame so that we are able to say, for example, um, as they refer to intelligence or information, diplomats who wanna know about a historical precedent a recent best practice, a lesson learned from a mistake should have ready access to that 
in a sophisticated manner that is also still very mm -hmm. secure. So the answer to Karen and Jack is an overwhelming yes. Uh, but that's going to take new funding and it's going to take new expertise and a new way of looking at things in, uh, that will break up some of the bureaucratic strictures that have prevented us from being as effective as we could be. Okay, we have, we have really no minutes, but this is important because this is where you're headed. This is where you're headed. Um, and I'm gonna combine two questions and, and uh, inject a third from uh, a colleague. Uh, so anonymously, should President Trump receive a second term, would you expect him to be receptive to the project you have described? And within that, specifically, I think we need to address the matter of race, given his remarks on tape to Bob Woodward uh, that have been reported in the last 24 hours. Also, what does a change in president with his diplomats do to the work that was done by the previous ambassador? That's a question from Martha Vera in El Paso, Texas. You can reverse the order, you can take it. You can all have a, a whack at it as closing remarks to wrap up this excellent program. Uh, I'll, I'll, be glad to, I'll be glad to start and to try. Um, first, um, if President Trump is reelected and he's the president on January 20, 2021, uh, I hope that um, he will look at what we have done uh, and find some utility to it. And when we've talked about all throughout our project and today, nonpartisan, we mean that. So we've been in touch with the State Department. We are going to see the Under Secretary of State for Management. I hope we will see the Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began. Um, I think that we have tried very hard in the paper that we've sent you and some of the underlying recommendations that we have pr proposed or will propose to make sure that these are not partisan recommendations. These are recommendations that if you'd like to have a professional, effective diplomatic service that serves the people of the United States of America, here's some things that you can do. And so I would not be defeated by this. I would say, whoever is president, I hope they will listen to us. That's their prerogative. They can do what they want. Uh, but we've set our recommendations in such a way that they are nonpartisan. They are bipartisan, number one. Number two, one of the reasons that we're working so hard, uh, Bill, as you mentioned, uh, to meet members of Congress uh, is, is that there are Republicans and Democrats there as well. And so we hope that uh, before the election and after we can convince as many people on both sides of the aisle to be interested in this because there's no way there's new legislation. There's no way there's new funding uh, without the bipartisanship involved. And so we'll see. Uh, but we've taken the position in it doesn't matter. We're going to put the best recommendations forward and then come what may. On the question, on the second question of, you know, what happens when new people come, you know, well, things happen. Human beings, you know, have new ideas. Human beings have new ways. But to go to your previous questioner, I think Marcy answered this question really well, which is to say it's the president that sets foreign policy and ambassadors are in a chain of command. And that chain of command goes from the President of the United States to the Secretary of State to the Assistant Secretary of the Ambassador. And so that's how policy gets set, and that's how policy should be perceived. Marcy and Nancy, would you like to have some final comments? Marcy, please. I, I think this, I, Mark's comment goes to where I started at, uh, at the beginning that I'd really like to reiterate, and that is that one of, the, one of the really key ideas that we've been working on is that the Foreign Service needs to be connected to and represent the American people and, and their leaders. And this is, um, and we feel that things have gotten a bit out of alignment uh, over decades actually. And so, so our project and all aspects of it are, organized to try and bring us back into alignment, back into a situation where the American people know about their foreign service or their diplomatic service. Uh, uh, their children want to join the diplomatic service. They know what we are doing and they support it. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's what we're really about here. 
That's terrific, Marcy. The only thing I would add to what Mark and Marcy have, have so eloquently stated is a, a final point, which we often shorthand as diversity, but I think Bill, you really said it best. In order to have a diplomatic service that is achieving our goals as a country that is embodying our values, our belief in equity and inclusion, social justice, empowerment of all people, regardless of their backgrounds. We have to have a foreign service that doesn't just look like America, but acts and thinks like it, and that upholds those values around the world, human rights inside our country and in other countries as well. And so we will be calling for a foreign service for specific steps to get a foreign service that looks and, and acts that way uh, internally and operates that way around the world. And it's such a privilege to be able to talk to all of your members and to be able to exchange ideas. It, it's really been a fantastic time. Thank you for making it possible and thanks to everybody for joining us. I want to thank Ambassador Nancy McEldowney, Ambassador Marcy Reese, Ambassador Mark Grossman uh, for your thoughts and insights and your hard work on this very important project that we hope at the World Affairs Councils of America and our 90 individual councils around the country that we can continue to work with you, um, not only on the outcome of this project, but to host the expertise that the Foreign Service uh, brings to our country currently and with retired uh, diplomats. I also wanna thank um, uh, the Future of Diplomacy Project at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs for the opportunity to partner our West Coast uh, Council partner, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for their promotional push out there in the other coast. And to all council leaders and members and uh, the public that they serve for joining us today, it's vital that you keep engaged on this and so many of the issues that councils undertake. I urge you strongly to support your local councils with, don with donations at this time of a COVID pandemic. We know you have many choices for your philanthropy, but we believe our work is good. And at the, at, at the Waka National Office, we have two big events for your calendar. One is our conversations with the C-suite, a new initiative focused on how business leaders, both American and non-American, are viewing their industries, their companies, and the post-COVID economy. This will be September 29 to October 1. And as usual, our national conference, not as usual, virtual this year, but right after the election when we will be dealing with all manner of national security, foreign policy, economic and trade, social justice, experts, thinkers, think tankers, and people to have a discussion on so many of the issues that confront our society. And we wanna keep it democratic, so vote. I don't care who you vote for, just get out there and vote. And thank you again to the distinguished panel for being with us today. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs>